All right. Welcome to the Golf Coach Podcast, Andreas. How you going, man? Thank you. I'm doing very well. Hey, mate. I appreciate you coming on. Um, it's, it's, it's good to have you on. I think there'll be a lot of golf, co- golf coaches who have seen the headline to this and will be excited to kind of see you come on. You know, obviously, you're, you're a big influence in the, I'm going to call it the social media uh, well, with golf instruction, but we don't see you in front of the camera very often, do we? No, <laughs> no, it's that's it's not. I mean, it's never the point. <laughs> yeah, it's never the point. I understand. I understand. So, tell me, how's your morning, mate? What have you been up to? It's been great. I uh, got up at uh, I got up at five thirty. Um, yep. Got my youngest out of bed, so him some morning skate. Um, yep. Took him to school. Oldest one came to morning skate. I went back and actually watched that. I have today's my like admin day. Yeah. So spent the first couple of hours this morning in a ice cold hockey rink. Um, yeah. Just got back and then uh, yeah, just in here. How do you? So you got two boys and they they both ice play ice hockey. Yes. Is that as much of a passion for you as it then as it is for um, golf? Yeah, for sure. I, I don't know. It's okay. it's it's become. It wasn't. I mean, my oldest started by accident, but it's a. I don't know. I think it's a really, really. I don't know. I enjoy watching learning. I enjoy watching progress. I also enjoy watching my own kids. Mm. But in general, I enjoy watching progress. And I think sometimes in the in my day to day work, it's at times it can become hard to like you're working on something with a player. And it might take, hell, it might take six months before you actually see the benefits of what you did yep. and what you started practicing, where hockey is simpler in a sense. There's, you skate around, there's some sort of technique that you can't do, you practice it, and all of a sudden when it's, then it works. And then you do it in a game, and then all of a sudden it's learned. You don't have to worry about it anymore. And the same thing goes for shooting, stick handling, whatever. And it just becomes, it's so much more instant. Mm. And then also the, the failing is also so easy to see because, I mean, if you're trying to do something, you can't do it. You fall on your ass and then you get back up and you do it again. Yeah. Whereas, I don't know, I'm not, I'm, I try to be really, really patient by nature. I'm not, but I know I have to be where yeah. when I see that, it's just so it's such an easy sport to like make things more difficult. I mean, I can do this skating exercise. Great. Now do it while you're stick handling a puck. Oh, I can't do it anymore. All right. That means that you can't really do it. You have to think about it. Right. Yeah. And then when you can do that, do it while stick handling a puck without looking at it. Now do it in a game, do it while there's somebody trying to, I was about to say kill you, but trying to hit you. Um, Like all these different, so there's just so much, the learning is so much easier to see where in golf, I mean, how you might've learned something that doesn't mean that you don't have time to think about it before you hit. Interesting. So, so even though you learned how to, let's just say, hold the club and your mm. grip's good, that doesn't necessarily, and it's learned. You don't have to think about it. When you grab a club, that's how you hold it. You still have time to go, you know what? I'm just going to check my grip just in case. Yeah. Yeah. And, so I just think that's, I don't know. It's, it's, an, yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. enjoy the thought experiment and like how do, I don't, I don't even think it's possible to actually transfer all, a lot over from hockey to golf that way. Just because, I mean, you have time to think whether you want hmm. to or not, you have time to think before you hit every single time you don't yeah. win hockey. No, it's very, it's very reactive, isn't it? But I guess what I hear you saying there as well is that you're talking about, the learning process and we talk about the same thing with golf right is i say my best golf swing is here in my studio and no one's watching you know then yes. my next best golf swing is when i got the quad turned on then my next best golf swings at the range and it kind of predominantly you know gets worse and worse and worse right and i'll always use the example of i remember when lucas herbert our friend of mine coaches him dominic has a party and he won his first tournament in bermuda in the in the in the wind right pga tour event and the last hole, I think he just hit like a, like it just looks like a standard knockdown eight iron shot into the breeze to like eight feet, right? Great shot <laughs> to win the tournament, leading by one and makes it happen. And I remember watching it live going, 
that shot became so much harder during the situation. Like he could do that with his eyes closed anytime. Mm -hmm. And people don't yes. understand when I tell them that that was such a great shot. But they're like, yeah, but it's just an eight iron from, you know, 170, whatever, into the breeze. I'm like, yeah, but the circumstances for that were just so challenging, you know, so difficult, yes. so different. And I really saw it there, Andres, you know, like I think that once that person, that, or that player can do that, that's when they build that real trust that they can handle those situations really well, right? It's just kind of really getting thrown in there. For sure. And it's, I mean, I think it's hard to find many other sports that are like golf. I mean, I'm guessing like what resembles it, like bowling maybe. Um, if the wind was also blowing, um, penalty shootouts in football would be fairly close. And you can see it. I mean, hell, just at the World Cup final uh, about a year ago, got the best players in the world in the final and all of a sudden they forget how to kick a ball. Yeah, it's crazy. Right? They're yeah. the best and all because now they have time to think. Mm -hmm. And they might shit that all kinds of stuff might show up, right? Like where do I place my left foot? Where do I like how far away from the ball do I walk back? Yeah. Should I put it there? Should I I'm I'm guessing most of those guys would be a hundred out of a hundred at practice. Like yeah. they're the goalie, they can put it in an area where the goalie would never save it. And all of a sudden, because of where they are and the situation they're in, mm. all kinds of thoughts start to creep in, right? Yeah. And we've seen it. We've, we've seen it firsthand. Everyone listening to this has seen it in a golf tournament, you know, in, in a closing tournament, a PGA Tour event. You're like, that guy did not have that shot all day, you know, <laughs> and, and no. you see yeah. you come in all the time and, 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 um, I share this story a lot, Andres, on the podcast before we get into the stuff I want to talk about, the topics we got. But talking about handling situations and Cam Smith at the Open when he won it, and there was a few scenarios about – like I remember I was working with a guy you know, at a golf course a few years back, and he used to play with Cam as a kid. And Cam was coming through, and every time he played something, he was just dominating. Like he'd go from juniors straight to the, um, you know, the amateur men's state team straight to the Australian state team, uh, Australian team, like just every time he got, got a start in a PGA Tour event, makes a cut, gets his first start in a major championship at Chambers Bay, finishes tied second. It's like I remember he, just, he just keeps like showing up and then he gets into the open, um, gets a chance and, and he wins. And um, I was at a, a coach awards thing last year and he was up there talking and Ian Baker Finch said to him, um, what was that situation like? Like, talk us through your major championship win. And anyway, talking about a scenario, and they said, were you nervous? Um, how are you feeling? And he goes, yeah, I couldn't feel my hands. I was shaken. But he goes, that's when I play my best golf. And you know when you know people are bullshitting you, right? I knew, Andres, right then that he actually meant that. You could see it in his eyes. I still get goosebumps when I tell that story because you could tell that that guy actually wants to be in that situation. He's like, I'll do it. Not a problem because he's got track record where, I don't know about you, but put me in that situation. I won't have a panic attack, <laughs> scull a bottle of alcohol and try and run away, you know, because I don't want to hit that shot. You know what? You know what? And that, I don't want to sound arrogant, but that's how I was as well. Really? Give me, give me, give me a chance. Everything starts like shaking and I get tunnel vision. Interesting. I, I wasn't all, I mean, I was all right. I was never really that great at golf, but I was good enough to get a scholarship in the States and play and win some pro events. But yep. I mean, I'm pretty sure I'm eight for eight in playoffs. And I'm wow. also pretty sure I buried every single one of those. Wow. I just wasn't really all that good of a ball striker to actually get in contention all that often. Yes. But if I was there, I was winning. That's so interesting. So it was like, give me, just, just put me there and I'll, and I'll, and I'll go, well, that's that's a really that's a good mindset. Yeah. You know, I I definitely um back myself, but in those yeah, top end situations, you definitely find out the men, men from the boys. For sure, but I, I think it's a drug. For me it was. I'd be willing to practice. I didn't really particularly like practice all that much, but I'd put in 40, 50 hours a week, every yeah. week, if I could just get a taste of that twice a year. Yeah, interesting. Because when I played um, Andres, I actually, I played too much out of fear. You know what I mean? Like way too much yeah. out of fear. 
That was my problem. Yeah. I always scored well, yeah. played well, like finished high in the order of merit in yeah. Australia, like stuff, but it was never that convincing. I was never, but that's interesting yeah. that you did that. Did you have any scenarios where you just felt that or you just, you, you, you like any stories you could share or you just kind of remember just no. not, being, not being in? Not I, don't, being I, don't, I, I, I recall the first time I was in it and I wasn't supposed to be there. I completely overperformed in a men's event when I was 15 years, 16 years old, maybe. Wow. And ended up in a playoff with the best amateur in the country at the time. And I think he'd birdied the last three and I'd part the last three. Um, and I was sitting in the locker room before the playoff started going, you know what? I'll show him. Like, I got everybody him. thinks he's going to win it now on the young guy who nobody knows. And yeah. I'll, I'll show him. And I, uh, yeah, again, I think I one put it. There was three hole playoff. I one put it all three holes. Wow. And That's birdied awesome. the last one. That's awesome. Yes, I've, I don't. That's. I don't know. It was a drug to me. I can't do it in any other sports. I suck at it. Ping pong. I suck at it. Bowling. <laughs> paddle tennis. Whatever <laughs> stuff. I'm not good at. Can't do it. I was, yeah. Like golf. I can do it. Interesting. I do love an underdog mentality. Yeah. I do. I do like the old uh, fuck them all. Show them. Show them what I got. I do like that. Yeah. I do like proving them wrong. I, don't, I think it's a pretty important part. Yeah. Great. All right. Well. Tell me, what, what dominates in Denmark, golf or ice hockey? Oh, golf, big time. Golf does? Yeah, for sure. Like, ice hockey is small. It's not even within, like, membership-wise, oh. within the top 25 sports in the country. I think oh, really? Same. Yeah, it's football, like, golf. Yeah. That's, like, the one and two. So, yeah, for sure golf. For sure golf. Yeah, and and, and yeah. what is – and and – how is like golf in Denmark? Obviously, you know you're, you're playing a big role there with your academy, which we'll get into. But it's pretty well followed golf. Like like that like in Australia here, yeah. you know, it's it's fifty fifty. We still got our major sports. We've got like our rugby league. We've got um our AFL and our rugby and our cricket's pretty big, and then kind of yeah. golf slots in there. You know. Well, yes and no. I think it's really well followed by the people that play golf. I think for a country of I think we're 5.8 million total. I think we have 150,000 active golfers. So it's okay. a pretty good percentage, mm. uh, especially considering how shit the weather is. Um, <laughs> exactly. Um, we there's we have our own golf channel. Interesting. Like there's a Danish golf channel, which basically the golfers follow. I don't know of anybody who doesn't play golf who even knows that that channel exists. I don't see... It's gonna. It's every now and then you'll see something in uh, mainstream media, but it's rare. Like Nikolai Hoygaard just won the DP World Tour yes. Finals, right? Um, that was in mainstream news, but in general, it's not. Okay. Um, but yeah. it's a it's a large sport. Yeah, okay. membership wise. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, he did win. Hey, that was pretty exciting, right? He played Ryder Cup, Ryder awesome. Cup, and Ryder Cup and wins. The pretty good. It's it's amazing. So tell uh, you know before we get into it, um, a lot of people who are watching this right will be following. You know, most likely have followed you on social media, right? You've got this cult following, mate. You're like you're like the the Kim Kardashian of the Instagram golf world, mate. <laughs> but <laughs> but and, and what you do right is, and I've always spoken about this to the quality of your coaching. And I spoke to Jay Kelly about this, you know, Stephen Giuliano about what you do is when people know what they're going to get when they see Andreas, right? They're going to see an, a nice wide trail arm, not, not going past 90 degrees, top of the backswing, high hands. They know what they're going to get, right? Like full extension. And um, I kind of see that branding with you, but when, so you're a part of this Danish junior Academy. Can you go into a little bit of the history of that? Yeah, it was founded probably 15 years ago. Yeah. Uh, a guy named Peter Thompson and a guy named David Dickmeis, who is now runs the women's pro team now for the Danish Golf Union. They started yeah. it up 15 years ago just because there wasn't – golf is a very accessible sport in Denmark, like yeah. extremely accessible. It's cheap. It's um, You get a lot for your money if you're a junior golfer, which means that there's – a lot of junior golfers in Denmark. Now the thing is the 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 clubs, the whole let's call it like the the the, the point of the clubs is to have as many junior golfers as possible. Okay. So what you end up having is you have all these group practices where I guess about ten kids an hour show up who are around the same age or skill level. 
And really what you have to do as a coach at the clubs is that you have to start at the bottom. Like the four kids who don't really want to be there, those are the ones that are going to get your attention uh, because you need to get them motivated to play golf and make them want to keep coming so they keep paying their membership. Um, Now, the thing is, what do you do for the one kid in that group or the two kids in those groups who actually are golfers? Meaning kids that, you know, they go to the course even when there's not practice. They go play on the weekends on their own by their own make their own decision to go to the course. Uh, they Maybe they think about it when they go to bed at night. Maybe they think about it when they get up in the morning. They like golf. Like, they're golfers. They don't just play golf. And they decided 15 years ago to start these camps where they invited a boatload of kids between, I don't know, the age of like 9 and 12 who were golfers mm-hmm. to get them together, to practice together, to see each other more often and be in an environment that turned into uh, weekly practices. And I guess 11 years ago I was hired to run the junior Academy on the East coast. Yep. And I mean, on the East coast, we've just kind of went from, it's a junior Academy, but I'm guessing, I mean, we have Marcus Helikid who's now 26 years old, who's still part of it. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's not really only a junior Academy anymore because they kind of, some of them stick around. And they still yeah. enjoy that type of practice. They have designated hours where they know they can show up, uh, practice in a group of, depending on skill level and time of the day and stuff. Like it changes how many are in the groups, but we put enough time aside, um, and then we just—I mean, honestly—we just try to make it fun. We try to answer their questions. We try to help them out in whichever way we can, and. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, it's it's a, it's 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 it's. I can't believe it's been eleven years. But I mean, since then we've had. You remember some of them, like mm. Emily Pedersen would walk around up there when she was, I don't know, nine years old. Um, now she's played a couple of Solheim Cups, the Olympics. She was. She's, she's pretty nice close to winning two weeks ago on the LPGA. Um, yeah. And you start seeing these players that start. They've gotten good. What. What what does it uh, let's say just a, a junior is there a schedule for the week like what does say I yeah. don't know just just a, a one fourteen year old you know, scratch golf what does his weekly schedule look like uh, it depends um, yep. it depends on how many hours they put in a week really okay. um, I want we have let's just say as a standard group we have a group that practices every Tuesdays from four thirty to seven thirty in the evening. And then they have every other Saturday we have practices from 8 to 12 in the mornings. Um, so that's seven hours. That's, I guess, on average, five and a half hours of practice a week. Yeah. I have, like, as a standard guideline, I want us to see them at most one-fourth of their practice time. So if you're going to be in that group, I have an expectation that you're putting in over 20 hours a week, also during the winter. Okay. Uh, or else you're probably going to be disappointed with the development because at the end of the day, it's – it's them that needs to put in the work. We just need to make sure it's smart work they put in. Yeah. Um, we're not going to force them into anything. It's a golf is different in that way. Like you can put in as many hours as you really want, and you probably need to put in quite a few to get yeah. really good. Mm. And that does not mean just getting more and more lessons. That also means <laughs> thinking about like, what am I doing here? Like, yeah. but what we basically do is give them the homework. Yeah. Okay. They have, they have on top of that, then they have the ability. It's almost built like a pyramid, the program, so you can move up and down the pyramid. Well, you can't move down, but you can join in further down on that pyramid. So if you want to show up for more practices, we have a practice where there's uh, kids that are between 8 and 12 who, um, who just love golf more than anything. We practice with them Friday evenings. You can come if you're in the Tuesday group. You're always welcome to join in. Some of them do. Um, they know it's not necessarily their practice time, but they can join. Um, they can practice with them. I think it does something good that the players can see what the what the next level looks like. Um, they yeah. know each other's names. They support each other. Um, and that goes all the way through, all the way up to the top group, which are now, I guess, two DP World Tour players. Um mm-hmm guy on the challenge tour and three guys who plays the Nordic league, they will also join in on our high school practices. Yeah. That's cool. 
That's such a cool yeah. environment. Well, that's what I spoke to Stephen Giuliano today, actually, and I said to him, I got Andreas on the pod. What do you reckon? What should I ask? And he asked a very, you know, good question. He said, um, about how big is it and how did you build this great culture that you have at this academy? Because I'm going to say that golf right is an incredibly individual sport where it's like player, coach, there's a team around them generally, but it's an individual team. What you seem to have there is a culture of players who are wanting nothing but the best for each other at the same time. I'm sure there's still a lot of competition. They're competing. They're competing. But I just really love to see that environment. Like, did did you is that a priority of yours to make sure that you kept building that culture? Like, can you expi- expi- explain a bit further? It's, about the, that? it's the most. I think it's the most important priority. Mm. Yeah, I would agree. That we are uh, in a place where we can. It's safe to fail. We pick each other up. We're also honest that if somebody is slacking, somebody else can let them know. But on the other hand, it's in a good supportive way. Um, of course, it's, I mean, it's junior golfers. They're going to step out of line. And then that's becomes really my assignment or my job is to make sure that I then get to talk to them and let them know that when we do this, we handle it this way. Um, what yeah. I've, what I've found is that at least that's what I believe is that the mindset of the players is way more important than the skill level of the players that practice mm-hmm. together. Um, so I had, kid named Frederick, who is just the best, one of the best kids I know. Like if one of my boys grow up to just have like 10% of his moral compass, yeah. I've, I've done well. Um, he's really, really, he was really, really good. He's turned pro with the lowest handicap ever in Danish golf history. He was a plus 7.9, uh, oh. just insane. Uh, yeah. Went straight on to the Challenge Tour, uh, qualified through the Nordic League as an amateur. He would still join in at practices on Tuesdays with players that were 14, 15 years old just to show up and get his technical work done because he likes to be in a certain group in that environment where he just goes, there's just a mindset because he doesn't really like practicing his technique. He just knows it's necessary. Yeah. Where he goes, as long as I'm around them, like they get their work done in an hour and the the vibe when they get that work done inspires me. Interesting. He goes, that's only the only reason why I come is to practice next to them. Now, if I want to compete, I'm not going to be in that group because I'm going to whoop their ass. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But so they get something from each other. Mm. And I think that's super important. Now, I the do- problem is that that stuff's not measurable. What the hell's mindset? I can't measure mindset. It's a lot easier to measure age or skill level or handicap or something like that yeah. or club speed. But I think it's something that we we try to nurture and it's something that we, um, or at least I'm very, very uh, mindful of. I, t- I tell you what I like about that environment as well um, is I reckon I would spend a lot of my time talking to, you know, um, not a lot of my time, sorry, but I've had many conversations with golf pros, young golf pros or kids that want to turn pro and I have to explain to them what my good guys and what their training schedule looks like, what their mindset's like, what it, what it actually is. I was like, you're not doing it you're, to, to a degree. You know, obviously it's like yeah. you're not doing this environment. You're like you're not – you need to come see what – x is doing right i won't mention because they're most likely to listen but you need to come see what x is doing more but what you're doing there is that they're already seeing what these guys are doing because they're surrounded in that environment and they know what it takes and they're learning from being in that environment not by being told as well which i think is really valuable because i have some pros that think they're working hard andreas and they're nowhere near working hard <laughs> in my no, eyes. No, and that's, that's the thing, right, is that it becomes more and more, I mean, I'm fortunate, it becomes more and more validation to what we do that the top players are playing better and better and now they're actually on on the world stage. They're mm. on TV. They're playing, like, they're playing for big money. Mm. So I get to, well, I, I, honestly, I have to do less and less of it. Yeah, because I can just point and go, "Hey, look at Sebastian over there. Look at Marcus. Look at what he does." Yeah, I don't even have to explain stuff anymore. Yes. Um, yeah, which I guess 
I'm good with, to be honest, that I don't have to convince anybody. I can just, so you can be inspired by him. Yeah, I, I, I 100%. Um, and that works better <laughs> than being told. It's, like, I think that's... Instead of, yeah, instead of some old dude who couldn't make it, who's <laughs> telling you what he thinks you should do, right? Because again, yeah. I can't, I can't, I, again, I'm fully aware, I can't tell them exactly what to do. Yeah, of course. That's yeah. individualistic. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I know what not to do. Yes. So when I know somebody's so certainly not doing it, they're putting in their headphones every time they're practicing and they're listening to music, I know that's not going to work. So I'll let them know. Now, I don't have necessarily have the problem with headphones. I have the problem when they're telling me what their goals and dreams are. And I look at the work that's being put in and I can just see there's a gap here because that work's not going to do this. Now, I don't can't yeah. guarantee you that if you do this instead, you're going to get there. I just know for a fact that you're not going to make it if this is what you do. So oh, either we man. have to change the goals and the ambitions yeah. and then you continue on like, cause I'm good with that. Just change it. Tell me you want to be club champion. Yeah. Tell me you want to play for your club's first team. Then you're still doing plenty of work. I just want to make sure that you don't feel cheated, that you thought yeah. you did everything you could yeah. and you didn't get to where you wanted to get to. Oh mate. I, I, how often, you know, not how often, but I use the terminology of like, um, your output is not matching your goals. <laughs> it's, it's, no, and it's, 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 and I'm biased because that's what I did. I thought yeah. it was a ma matter of hours. I put in the hours. Mm. They were shit hours, but I put them in because I thought it was a matter of hours. And I wish somebody would have told me. I don't, that still wouldn't have made the difference because I'm pretty sure I would have never made it. I don't think I was good yeah. enough. I don't think I had the mindset for it. But looking back at it, I can go, you know what? That was not my best effort. It was the best effort with what I knew and what I thought. Yeah. But I wish I would have asked some more people because what I was doing was certainly not spending the time wisely. Yes, I, I would. Uh, um, yes, I hear what you're saying there. But I also think as well as that when we when we use the term like we wouldn't have made it or, or those types of kind of comments, I think it's a little bit hard on us to a degree as well because what is made it and what's not made it but also there's no freaking room like let's let's talk about there's two tours well at the time when we were going there was two tours to play on right there's 150 spots on each one you know we're to make a living and at the time no disrespect to the asian tour back in the day but it wasn't a great tour to be fluffing around on like i knew people that were uber driving on their off weeks to try and get a flight back there to play. So, yeah. and I, and I, um, you know, Dominic as a party spoke about this a few episodes ago about like thinking, he goes, how many spots are there on tour, you know, each year to get, and there's a handful, yeah. right? And he goes, how many people do you reckon are trying to get those spots? And he goes, do you reckon about a hundred thousand? I said, I don't know. He goes, it wouldn't it be good to know. So he's like, what are you doing to try and beat those, hundred thousand people that want those five spots too and it's sure as hell you better be training hard and working hard and listening to some people around you so yeah i thought that was because i believe there's a room a lot more room for a lot more tours andreas there's a lot of good golfers out there that just got nowhere to play don't you reckon yeah yeah i agree yeah. i agree i just think that there's the people that run them also has to be pretty smart Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. I understand. I don't want to get involved in any type of being on a uh, running a tour and like, like that. But I look at all the soccer leagues or football leagues, as you might want to call it, right? There's tons of them. And I had friends of mine that were playing in like divisions I never heard of, making heaps of money. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like one yeah, of my, yeah. Yeah. my business partners with my training aid business that we're, we're you know we're working with the engineers now. The few training aids we're working on and. He was like, yeah, I played soccer in this league in Ireland and he did well, like cash-wise. I'm like, man. Yeah. But there ain't yeah. no golf tour there, you know, making any money. No, like, no. <laughs> no. No. All right, let's, before we get into some other questions, right, can you tell me about, let's just talk about one case study. I'm going to not do his last name well, but Marcus. How do you say his last name? Haley Keeler. Oh, yeah, I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> no, nobody does. I wouldn't have done that very good at all. Um. I, I feel like to me that he's the one that I've seen you um, talk about a bit. I think he's yeah. your, would he, is he your, uh, what's the word model? 
that you is that the one that you used yeah. for Andrew he, Rice? Well, he used he he used to be my model. He doesn't <laughs> swing it like that anymore. <laughs> he still is my model. His old swing was my model. Interesting, because I watched the Andrew Rice um, yeah. teaching thing yeah, you did, yeah. and I thought that was Marcus yeah. there. All right, so yeah. um, tell me about Marcus. Tell me about his. Tell me. Let's let's log him in for the next five minutes. Well, um, I'm fortunate. I guess he's fortunate too that he met me at the right time. Um, but I'm. I got hired at the academy eleven years ago. You know, I'm a new guy. People are looking. They're like, who's that guy? Blah, blah, blah. All these different things. He's the first guy who reaches out. He's 17, 16, 17 years old and goes, dude, can you help me out? I've got some questions. Yeah. Um, I was, I don't know. At the time, I thought everything was sorted out in the golf swing. He'd taken lessons from everybody. Didn't like the answers he was getting. Uh, would ask me. I guess he liked my answers. Yeah. Um and he got better. Mm-hmm. So we started working more and more and more. I think he made it to did he make it to the finals of the Danish Boys Championships. He wasn't in the boys national team or anything. That was his final year as a junior player. Um, but he made it to the finals, did all right um, after we started practicing. Uh, the year after, he was in the or the same year actually, he was part of the high school program we started up. So we spent a lot of time together. He would ask me better and better questions. Um, I would have to come up with answers. And for a long time, Mm. he kept improving. Like he made a big jump when I think he was 19, 20, where all of a sudden from out of nowhere, he got all the way to like 27th on the world amateur rankings. Um, Oh, wow. Won like shot 59s in tournaments and won whatever there was to win dominated um and she played extremely well yep. so he was basically whenever he had a question i would tell him what to do whenever somebody else had a question he was my reference point okay well, i did this with marcus we're just going to do that it looks like that has a leads to be you get better mm-hmm. and for a while a lot of players got better and he got better too and every time there was a question the answer was in his golf swing Interesting. Until we basically got it to, and he was progressing until we got it to a 10 out of 10, where I thought it was, uh, it's freaking, there's Smart. no leaks anywhere. It's per, It's pretty much as close to perfect as you can get this. Yeah. And uh, then he lost his challenge to a card. <laughs> wow. So all of a sudden you go like, oh. What does that do, right? And mm-hmm. we started talking, and what he said too was that he all of a sudden he would put himself on such a short leash because the swing was great. So why should he ever hit a bad golf shot? Okay. So he wouldn't even give himself any room for error, which actually made him play worse. He tried to play perfect, tried to do all these different things. Um, so all of a sudden, I had to come up with new answers, right? Yep. So we started talking a lot more about mental processes, about what we do off the golf course, what we do different ways, uh, strategy. We'd already been done a bunch of strategy stuff at that time, but also just getting access to this stuff when you actually compete. Um, yeah. And that, on the other hand, COVID hit. He got relegated down to um, the Nordic League, did extremely well again, came straight back and I would say technique wise it was still good it's still good it's a nice golf swing he's a good player yeah but I would say it's probably more like an eight and a half out of ten but there were some other factors that became way better that meant that all of a sudden from having like a small category he won three events on the challenge tour one got three second place finishes yeah won the challenge tour got to the European tour um yeah, I kept his card the first year, and then here second year, he, I think he missed the finals by 1.1 1. 1 point. Yeah, so he finished it. 51st. Yeah, but you know it. what? It's still the best year he's ever had. So yeah. you know what? Yeah. You're always going to end up missing out on something at the end of the year, basically. Yeah. So it's been, I'd say it's been as much a learning process for me as it has, it has been for him. I'd only been coaching for three years when we met. Yeah, okay. I just finished my apprenticeship. Um, yeah. And I'd say that he, in a lot of ways, he 
does what I want it when I start out with players. I don't want them to be too dependent on me. I don't want them to like home check in like every day, every other day, all these different things. Um, he checks in when he needs to check in. Mm. And that's what I tell all my players that it's, it's theirs. It's their golf game. It's their business. They're the CEO, all these different things. I understand that that's not where they at when they start, but that's the goal is that yeah. I'm just like a compass who's just making sure things are in the right direction and that my phone's always open. I'm always available if they need my help. But if you don't reach out, I expect that you're about to play really well. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I, I would agree that with, with, with players, I think that's a really valuable lesson for people listening about stop leaning. You could potentially be leaning on the golf coach too much. Um, a lot of, I think a lot of players are leaning on it and leaning towards lessons too much, that kind yeah. of type of way. The easy way to put it to me is what the way I like it is that um, you look at the PGA Tour with the players and how much the golf coaches are getting paid. That's about as much as portion of the golf the golf coach is having on the player. Like it's a very small portion compared to what the big yeah. guys are getting. You know what I mean? Like I know we're, we're playing yeah. a big role. You certainly are. Yeah. But teamwork I think is a really good – I like to use the word teamwork a lot. Like ask them questions back so they can try and answer their own questions as well. And, yeah, I really like that. Yeah not leaning on you too much and you know he's going to play well when he's not in contact. That's pretty cool. That's a cool thing to know. That's yeah, usually my expectation at least. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's what happens. Every yes. Time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then we have a conversation, right? And then we yeah. have we have rules in place for different stuff. Like you're not sending me swings on a Wednesday when you're entering a DP or whatever event on Thursday. Mm, mm, Just, mm. I mean – well, that's actually one of the few rules that's universal. Like you're not recording yourself and like yes. you don't get, if you're starting Thursday, you're not recording yourself Wednesday and you're also not recording yourself Tuesday. That's just the way it is. Yeah. Yeah. Cause at yes. that time it's basically too late. Um, yeah. so unless something's completely screwed, you're not recording yourself. So you're sending me swings on a Wednesday. Yeah. Then you broke our deal. <laughs> really? Yeah. And yeah, yeah. Again, like he's not perfect. He's guilty of it. I was like, <laughs> he'll send yeah. me every, t- I think it was from Kenya one year or something. He sent me something. Where I'm like, are you sending me swings on a Wednesday? He goes, oh shit. We have like, I'm not going to send that. Like that's the deal. Right. I go, yeah, I forgot. Sorry, man. All right. Good. <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. Because I think, um, yeah. And, and what it also does is it puts a little bit of the mental side of it is back on the player to try and find it themselves. Like, what have I got? What can I find? What have I got? You know, what is this that's here? Not so much like, oh, I'm going to take a film and Andreas is going to fix it. It's like, get me to the range. I need, I'm going to hit the shot that I need to hit. You know, I'm going to work it out. And, and Or the shot that I have. Yes. Sorry. That's, that's I'll tell one. you the, the, I'll tell you the, the one again, I guess it's validation for me is that when his swing was at its best and when I think his swing was the most consistent, he hit his best numbers when he was on a track man and he could repeat it the most was the year he lost his challenge to a card. Now we go this year, we go to Wentworth for the BMW and actually on Wednesday, he's hitting it really good. He's doing everything really, really well. He's hitting it well. He's chipping it well. He's putting it well. He's in a good mental state. His body's doing good. I'm going like, this could be pretty good. Mm. I'm there. Warm up on Thursday. It is shit. Like, it's, he's hardly making contact. Wow. Um, we have a couple of references just because that's, this happens multiple times, and he's actually played really well when yeah. he does that. So yeah. he walks to the first tee, and I go, dude, like, he goes, why well, do you think I'm hitting it fat? I go, doesn't matter you're just warming up goes oh yeah that's right i was just warming up he goes out he shoots eight under par first round leaves the bmw um the european tour stats which are i guess dicey but i mean they're not completely they're not dp world tour stats they're not completely off the mark says that he gains 5.3 strokes on approaches that day (laughs) that's some scotty shaffler stuff that and we eat dinner at night i go like what was that ball striking wise a b c d e game goes c go right good so that means that and that we're talking strike he goes 
So with a C game, you can gain 5.3 if you know your targets, you commit to your shot, you know what shot you have in the bag, and you hit that shot. Mm. So yeah. All right. So gaining or becoming a really good ball striker is not necessarily the same as being a really good approach player. I love that. Do you know what I mean? Yes. I, I think that's – yes. I, I, I – yeah. Yeah. Little Tiger. Okay, I did well, like when he played, when he was off. I think that's a really good way. So would you, would you can you use an example there, for instance, that if he wasn't striking at his best, he had good shot selection or he hit the the most predictable shot into a pin? Yeah. Like, do, do, yeah. Sure. He's, uh, it's not even pin relevant. Yeah, okay. It's, this is the shot I have. Yeah. I have a three-quarter thing that, it either pushes or draws. Yeah. That's the shot I have. That's the only shot I have. Yep. So I'm going to pick my target accordingly. And um, he almost, he's strange that way, but he feels it in his practice swings. When I think what he feels is face to path. He knows if that thing is staying out to the right, even before he hits. Um, so he just aims accordingly. He yep. knows this is going to be about a eight to 12 meter push. So, the target on the green is still the target. He just aims himself eight to 12 meters further left of that target. So he pushes it onto that marker where he wants the ball to land. Right. Yeah. Instead of going like when I play my best, it draws. So it's going to draw. And if it doesn't draw, I'm just screwed today. Yeah. Yeah. You play with what you have. Mm. Yeah. No, I, I, I think, yes. Love don't it. necessarily play with what you prefer. Yes. Well, I haven't hit, I haven't hit a fade in the golf course. I don't play a lot, but I haven't hit a fade in the golf course for 10 years because I know that it's not my shot. Like I cannot be better off hitting a fade at all. Like the pin's no. right. I'm better off hitting my my little in and out little hooky thing, right, and getting it middle of the green. Like that's what I'm better at doing than hitting a fade my yeah. most effectively. So yeah. can you just give me some quick numbers? So when you said Marcus was swinging his best and he missed his challenge tour versus – lost his challenge tour card versus now, for instance – when he's a much better player, obviously he's, he's competing on the TP World Tour and doing that type of stuff. And you think he's not swinging as good. What's different? Is it was he was he more neutral back in the day, and now he's more biased towards push draw? Like what, what's different? No, I'd actually say he's more neutral now. Interesting. Um, he's more neutral now, and he's more versatile in what he can play with. Um, okay. I would say if you put him on a track, man, he was. What was he? If the ball was sitting on the ground, he'd have a swing direction that was between zero and 0.5 negative. Okay. Um, depending on the ball position, he'd have an angle of attack that was, I guess, between two and probably 5.5 down, depending on what the club he hit. The shorter the club was, the more it was yeah. negative, which meant that the path was between one to three degrees to the right yeah. on every single shot he hit. Yeah, that's just the way it was built in, the way it was lined up, the way he did his stuff. What about and then he just do that over and over again? Yeah, I love that. All right, so you talk, you use a lot, a lot of track man, right? Obviously, people like people. Yeah, um, and you see lots of numbers. Do you prefer to see a player when we're talking about just talk about path numbers, right? Do you prefer to see a player more two or more? Either way, like negative two or two more, or do you like if you see someone that is too zeroed out with their path, do you find that challenging for them to create a predictable ball flight because of their face dispersion? Obviously, going to be a little bit out, or you, you no. don't mind that if they if they're no. zero, it doesn't matter. No, I don't think it matters. Okay, I think at the end of the day, the dispersion is a dispersion. Yes, and, I mean the face angle is the face angle, so I don't see why a four path to the right. Yeah gives you I guess it gives you more options on like not having an open face to path so the ball doesn't push fade. Yeah. But that still ends up giving you a dispersion where the, at the end of the day all your balls landed there. Yeah. And there's a center of that. So yeah. that's the center of the dispersion. So if somebody is curving everything to the left, he I mean he would <laughs> he has to aim more right. Yeah, and if, so I mean, it's just like I, it's. I don't. I, I don't. I don't see yeah, I anywhere where. I mean, if your zero path and your face to path variance is 
one and a half to the left and one and a half to the right. Well, that's pretty tough. That gives you some sort of dispersion. The dispersion yeah. pattern is going to look in a way where the it's the ones that are to the right are a little bit shorter and the ones that are to the left are a little bit longer. It's always going to look like this. Yeah. yeah. And whether you're doing that with a path that is four to the right, it's going to look like this. It's gonna, I mean, it's, it's going to end up kind of looking the same. So I think that becomes very player dependent. For me, yeah. my bias is always a push draw. Push draw, yeah. That's just my bias. I, mm. I like everything about it. I think it sounds better. Mm. I think it flies better. I think it um, holds it up better. I think it does boatload of stuff better. But I was also the guy who would always, if I ever had a miss, I'd leave one out to the right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have plenty of players. Mark is as an example. If a ball goes two feet to the left of where he is aligning his body, he's about to throw up. <laughs> Isn't if that he's got a, If he's yeah. got a four footer, he would almost rather miss it high than it like leak in from the low lip. Yeah. 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 Uh, on the other hand, I have Frederick, who is the exact opposite. Everything that ends up to the right of his stance line, he hates. Oh really? So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, completely hates. He just wants to pull it all day. If I could just <laughs> make it go left, I'm good. Yeah. Every single practice he does is a pull draw. He just pulls yeah. draw, pull draws it in every practice so he doesn't hit the push fade. I can relate to him. So yeah. that doesn't mean that I still don't have my preference. I'm just yeah. saying it's not necessarily correct. It's yeah. just what I prefer. Yeah, well just well just I had um a player oh, a couple of days ago. Uh you know, he's young father, like he's not in, in he's, I'm going to say he's a three handicap golfer, yeah. right? Uh, young father coming back from a wrist injury plays twice a month, but can handle three handicap quite well. Right. But he was zero, but his face control was just not that great. Right. He was like open, 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 close, open, close, open close. So he had a dispersion, I'm going to say of six degrees, Right. So he just he didn't really know where to aim to a degree, you know what I mean, Andre? So like he yeah. felt he felt a little bit and he goes, Toby, I was like, What pattern do you do? And he's like, Oh, I miss it left, I miss it right. I'm like, I pull it and then I push it. And I'm like, what, what are you talking about? Like, not like in my head, right? You know, you're listening and yeah. gathering information because I dealing with the golfer that's, you know, the one-off lessons in that business. And we found throughout my sessions, my sessions are a, a lot longer than normal sessions, right? We go for like, a, you know, an hour to 90 minutes for each individual. And we just found that with him that when we pushed him about three degrees right, we could just get his dispersion a bit tighter. You know what I mean? But yeah. but it's interesting that when you talk about with the pros and their preferences, like. Well, it's horrible to have a zero path if you want to see curve. Yes. Yes. I mean, it's, that's, not, that's not a functional shot. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. No. Yeah, no, I, I understand. I understand. And But I had a play the other day. We were talking about some certain players not liking things. And the pro was taking his, his hand off. And ugh. I was like, okay, that's interesting. I'm, I'm seeing a pattern here. He hates it left. And he'd hit one and go, yeah, I don't mind that. I'm like, yeah, that's, I'm in my hang on. That's 11 meters right. Last one was four meters left. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it was like okay, yeah. interesting. Yeah. It's interesting, but he, he just wants to always see the ball out there. Yep. Doesn't want to yep. see this thing. He's like, get that out of my golf game, Toby. I just want it there. Yeah. And, um, interesting. Very, very interesting. Hey, actually, before we go into, when I talked about systematic coaching, which, which one I've pretty much got you on for. Yeah. Run. But I have a, a back to basics putting segment in here. So a putting segment. So, Sponsors of the podcast are Back to Basics uh, Putting Mirrors, uh, Pro Path oh. Putting Mirror that uh, Gr uh, Cam Smith used, designed by Grant Field and Richard Woodhouse, you know, Grant Cam's coach, um, who actually I'll be seeing tomorrow, I think, at the Aussie Open. Um, he, yeah, so the Pro Path Putting Mirror, you know, if you get it, discount codes below, TM15, 15, 15 degree putting arc. Do you have any putting exercises, Andreas, that you can share with us or any drills or games or something that you like to use preference-wise? with your students that you can share with us in the back to basics putting segment? Yeah. Um, well, I have one that's, I guess it becomes, it's used on, well, it's good enough for Marcus. So it's gotta be good enough for most people. Um, I yes. think it's, it's simple, right? So he does a lot of like systematic work with his putting. He's got this whole thing where he gets on a putting mat, makes sure he gets eight out of eight through this gate. And then he's good. Then he removes the mat, gets another eight out of eight. Then he knows that his, aim and start directions good 
He yeah. just chops that off. Then he goes like, then he takes out his level. He always does his percentages on a daily basis. He yeah. practices four times a week on aiming his line on the ball to make sure that's really good. He does all these different things where he just checks off a bunch of stuff. And then he does sometimes a little bit of testing. Now the problem at times becomes that it can get really locked in where he almost kind of stops putting. Yeah. Um, because he actually has an incredible touch and he's actually visually extremely good at seeing different things. And sometimes it almost becomes there's only this one line with this one speed. So whenever I need to basically loosen him up, but this can be used as skill development as well for a lot of players, is that they can, I'll have them hit putts from 6 to 12 feet that has to break, they have to break so much that you have to aim it outside the hole on a regular speed putt. Okay. Well, I'll give them three balls, and then I will ask them to – I think I actually got this from John Graham back in the day. Um, yep. See if they can find the lowest line possible. So that will probably be about three feet past the hole approximately. And then hit it on that line. doesn't matter if it goes in or not, but try. Then I want the highest possible line, so something that almost comes in through the back door. Yep. And then find something in between that. Uh, I think what most regular golfers will find that the, the the better line is usually really close to that highest possible line. Yeah. Um, but I think also for better players, it actually gives them a sense that they can be a little bit creative with their putting. Because I think most good players, I think that's why they really don't enjoy putting all that much, yeah. is that it's you can't really do anything. You can't make the ball spin or curve. Or, yes. Like it's just kind of rolling it and then, you know, gravity takes over from there. So it becomes really stale. Yeah. I can have my boys and girls chip for hours because they can be creative. They can do stuff. Yes. And that gives them a little, at least a little bit of sense of power of yeah. like I can actually pick a speed where it's on me. Like I want to hit this thing firm. So that becomes this line. I want this thing to drop. But just actually walking around and doing that, and the most important thing is that the player pays attention. Because they don't pay attention, it doesn't matter. But you got to pay attention to where these balls end up because you get feedback. You get feedback on your read. You get feedback on your start direction. You get feedback on your speed yeah. on every single putt if you pay attention. Interesting. If you're just walking around doing it, it doesn't matter. So when you talk about the low line, the mid line, and the high line, right? Are they are they marking that out? Are you putting like something out there, or, or are they just putting a T? Or are they just that you just watching that nothing. ball? Just nothing. You're yeah, using the nothing. ball as evidence. Yeah, that's a really cool strategy. That's a really cool strategy. And I think I think for some it gives them a sense of power because I I love aim point, but yeah. I also what I don't like about it is that it became based on a at least back in the day that there was like a perfect speed for putts. Yeah. Yeah. That it had to be a foot behind the hole or be within half yeah. a foot to a foot because that's where the hole was the biggest. I think I think there's some really good putters on short putts who just by speeding up the ball just forces putts straight. Interesting. Like they yeah. might even point it and go, yeah, it's probably like a four footer. It goes like that's like a it feels like a one percent something. I have to put it a little bit to the right of center. And some will just go, screw that. You know what? I'm just going to go firm middle. Yeah. 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 No, I like it. I like strategy. Well, one of my students of the day, he just uh, missed out an Aussie Open pre by, I think, a shot. And he had three three putts. And he just hit 16 greens and just, just had a ball striking day. He actually used to play on the European Tour back in the day. And, nice. And he said to me, do you know aim point? <laughs> I said, I'm not really across it, but I can I can send you to someone who can help you with it because um, he played with a guy that just hold everything and was using aim point. He's like, I want to learn about this. Yeah. He's just an old school European tour guy, right? Like, and he's like, yeah. I, want, I want to know all. About, I want to know what this thing's about. I planned this guy kept shoving his fingers up in the air, but so I really like that strategy. So you think that's a really good way to keep people interested and on task is training the low line, the mid line, and and the high yeah. line that way there, and kind of seeing what works because- best for you too, right? Yeah, and it's also because I think a lot of people pick their read first and then they let the read dictate their speed. Yeah. And honestly, like the more good putters I talk to, it seems to me like they pick the speed out first. Yeah. They go, am I going to hit this one firm or 
medium or we call it red, yellow, and green, or am I going to make this thing drop? Yeah. And that's the first thing they do. And then they pick their line according to the speed they decided. Yeah. I would Which, definitely, I would definitely agree that that's what the best, the better players do because you hear the conversation with them on the green, talking to the caddy. Like if yeah. you're following your players around, you hear the first, the first conversation or question is like, you know, the caddy might say, "Where's this going into the hole?" You know, like where do yeah. you see going in? And that just obviously yes. dictates speed from there. So, like, where's yeah. your scent? Like, where, where's it going in here or here? And they'll go here. Okay, great. Well, then, then they backtrack from there because. They've already yes. got a feel for that person's speed for that part. Yeah, no, I definitely would agree with that. Oh, that's really cool. Oh, that brings us to the end of the Back to Basics putting saving. Thanks for that, Andreas, man, for that little one there, mate. That was, that was fantastic. All right, so let's get into some systematic coaching. Can you explain to us what systematic coaching is and how did you get involved and, and how did it become a part of your coaching? We Well, I'm, I'm trained. Um, I did – a lot of training with Stack and Tilt with Andy Plummer. I consider him my mentor. Yep. Um, I think along the, I, th I think actually like way back in the day, there was these slogans like Stack and Tilt, yep. life's more fun in the fairway or some crap <laughs> like that. Yeah. And I remember yeah. Andy going like, it shouldn't have been that. It's, we should have just been Stack and Tilt, the system for golf. Yeah. Because that's really what Andy taught me was how to systematically approach a golf lesson and also what to do at what time and when. Yeah. Um, that time passes, I guess, 10 years after meeting Andy, uh, Huma is presenting at the Danish PGA teaching summit. Mm -hmm. Marcus has just gotten his European tour card. He's just won the challenge tour. I reach out to him on that day. I go like, I enjoy learning from people. I also, I don't mind learning from my own mistakes but I really like learning from other people's mistakes just so I don't have to do them first. Yes. So I go, do you, do you mind if I buy your beer? And uh, I just want to hear like what's do's and don'ts. I've never been on the DP world tour before. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Tour coach, um, different, big, big game. Big who's game. been out there for like 25 years, right? Yes. Um, so we, I buy beers. We start talking. Um, I think at the, I, honestly, I think we start out at five and I think all of a sudden we're sitting in like the hotel lobby at three in the morning. <laughs> 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 yeah. And I think we honestly agreed on the ball is your guidance, is your guide yeah. in decision making. Yeah. Um, so if you're not changing ball flight, meaning impact, it's not worth changing yes. or improving. Yes. And the second part was that we both really, really deep in our souls believe that one of the worst inventions ever to hit golf is the high tee. <laughs> and besides that, I think we disagreed on everything else. Hey, it's so... I, I <laughs> And <laughs> it's funny you talk about that right before you move on. That's what he meant yeah. because I asked him some questions, right? Yeah. And he said, ask him about the night tea, but he must, and he said, he'll, knew, he'll know who asked, but he means the high tea. That's yes. interesting. So for, for context, yeah. people listening, right? Hugh is, um, he's been on the podcast before. We had him on recently, uh, coach to coaches and Andreas and Hugh do some stuff together. And Hugh is someone, um, who's greatly deep within the golf instruction world, but, um, and he wouldn't mind me saying this, is never afraid to speak his truth, right, and call people out on things, and um, he's very so honest, and he, you know, he creates a great learning environment, but um, he's a guy who definitely asks lots of questions and uh, is not afraid to speak his truth, right? So, um, no, yeah, and, and no. he's a great golf coach, and he's, he's fucking spent man, many a times on the DP World Tour, Ryder Cups, and, yeah, he's great. Yeah. But that, but that was the the good part about it because at the end of the day at three in the morning he goes you know what we should probably do a seminar about what we just did mm. because it was a it ended up being a long discussion on me and him just disagreeing on a bunch of stuff yes. or disagreeing on the how to do stuff mm. but not but being in total agreement on the what which Simple. yeah actually I thought made it. I guess made it kind of interesting because I think a lot of things are 
you go to a seminar, you learn the newest whatever, and this is how you do it. Yeah. And what, which, which, what I didn't realize, but I guess what Hugh had realized through his um, CMAS program and these different things is that a lot of coaches have a lot of tools and they're actually really, really well educated. They're just not very good at organizing it in their yeah. head on what to do when. Yeah. So he suggested, and I guess I agreed, that we should do something where we basically have a day each where we talk about what we do. Yeah. Um, we can disagree as much as we want. Like There'll be discussions and debates also between him and me. It's not us just telling people what to do. But actually, yeah. there's a couple of things you probably have to do. Like, you have to be able to defend why you suggested this. Yes. And that yeah. probably had to have some sort of effect on how the player hit the ball um, yeah. or where the ball went, or it's got to be injury prevention or something. You can't just, uh, it's just because I saw this or somebody taught me this and I figured I'd try it out. Um, which I think is really the main point because I think certification wise and education wise and all these different things. I think there are, how I've met them. There's plenty of guys who know way more than me um, yeah. and are smarter than me and who I will give a call if there's something that I'm unsure of. Cause I know that they know this type of, uh, these type of pressure plates, this 3d system, um, what this shoulder girdle does, uh, all these different things. But some of, even them are, it's not that they don't know enough. They just not, or they didn't organize their stuff well enough yeah. so that the player in front of them necessarily improves the fastest, the best. It doesn't mean that again, that I can't get into this trail hip. That's not internally rotating the way I think it should, but it might not be the right time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, com um, I completely understand. Or, or worthy of doing like, like yeah. when, when I talk to um, other golf coaches, well, like there's obviously lots of extremely smart people out there and I help, um, I'm going to say half a dozen coaches now as well, like online and they'll send me their case studies. I've got one to do now. And um, I find a lot of the time I find myself asking the question back to them. Why? Like, like, d d yeah. did that really get what you wanted out of it? Like, it might look like that's not right, but I don't think that's actually going to get you the result you need. You might get somewhere with it and you might change the orientation of that shaft at three, but it's actually yeah. not going to fix the ball flight. <laughs> no. And, and and again, and that becomes the thing, right? Is that you, ha I don't know, it's the way I thought it would run was when I did my PGA training. I had a year and a half before we actually did went to school. Yeah, I thought you had to defend every single decision you ever made doing a golf lesson. Okay. So I thought a lot for the first year and a half yeah. that how do I defend this? How do I defend this? What is this supposed to do? It's not necessarily right or wrong, but at least can you defend what your intention was? I don't get, I don't get all, I don't get my lessons right. Like I don't get hundred percent right at all. Mm. Yeah. But I got my stuff organized, or at least not at first. Um, I've got my stuff organized in a way where when I see this problem to the golf ball, I know where to look at first. Yep. And if I see this part being off, this is what we'll put in the work. And then I have my decision tree. This is what works. Let's put a number on it. 85% of the time, this drill works and helps this out. Yep. Now, it doesn't necessarily work 100% of the times, but we're going to try this first. And it didn't work. Okay. Then I have my option number two for this problem. And then I have option number three for the same problem. I'm not going to start going, oh, apparently it wasn't the um, the chest turning, not, the not turning enough on the follow through. Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. It's still the problem. It's still yes. the analysis is the same. Yeah. The chest is still too close to the impact. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm just going to go option one. 1A, which is the one that works the most often, then I'm going to go to 1B, and then I'm going to go to 1C and D and E, yeah. and when I learn something new, I'm going to put it in my decision tree and in my order, and when I need it, last resort, I'm going to try it out. Yeah. It's still trying to fix the same problem. Yeah. I I, I would, um yeah, so, yeah, I, I agree with you 
solely there. And so what Andre is saying to people, let people listening is that, say, for instance, that example he just briefly used there was that your chest might be too closed at impact. That's initial analysis. Chest is too closed. It's causing, let's call it. Path is too far to the right. Um, All right. And we know that. We identify that, right? And if you go to majority of coaches, they hopefully will tell you that, yes, your chest is too closed. And I remember one time talking to Sean Foley about it, and he said, the good ones, Toby, get it right the first time. Well, not the first time, sorry, but like pretty quickly. They can pick the right way to get the desired result. And what Andres is saying is that I'll often in my coaching too will say to the student, like, um, start a lesson. This is what we need to try and fix. Let's say chest. We need the buttons looking more in front of the ball at impact. We're looking about, you know, eight, 10 degrees open. That'd be enough for us today. Um, and, and, and I'll pretty quickly myself, Andres, I'll try X. I go, shit, that's not working. Let's throw in Y. Like, I don't, I don't even let them pound balls for a period of time to wait for it to happen. If it doesn't shift for me straight away, pretty quickly, right? Like, if it doesn't go in those first few balls, I go, nah, that's not, that's not even close. Next. <laughs> Next. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to yeah, sit there and pound. But I don't all of a sudden go, you know what? Let's do the takeaway instead. No. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah. That's, honestly, that's – and I'm – I didn't think that's what I saw, but that's what I see. Yeah. And I see people mm-hmm. and I understand the order because that's how some coaches taught golf. And it's also an easy way to do it is what's the first problem that I see mm-hmm. Oh, clubs too far in, then we're going to have to do the takeaway, but, and great. If you can relate that back to ball flight being better or strike being better. Yeah. Awesome. I would prefer, if I could, I would prefer to fix, set up, and take away every day if it helped people hit the ball better. Yeah, yeah. I just don't see the evidence all that often. Yeah, so what I'm hearing you say there, Andreas, is that you don't – I don't cater for the fact either that you shouldn't be hitting it worse. We know when people say, oh, you're going to hit it bad for a while. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't agree with that at all. You, you're the same. Oh, that's good. I, I, I hate it. <laughs> yeah. However, I, I, I will. I will say that there is a there's a little bit of an exception to this, and that is because we have six months of winter where yeah. we're hitting balls into nets. So yeah. I can actually start fiddling around with junior golfers' grips in October, knowing that we're not coming outside again before mid March. And I probably also know that this grip. This grip change where I'm changing like a lead hand like 15 degrees mm. is likely not going to make him hit it better immediately. Yeah. yeah. But if I'm outdoors in a golf lesson, people need to hit the ball better as soon as possible. Yeah. It's not two weeks and watch out. Yeah. You just yeah. got to get through this. I've done that. Yeah. Mine was like a year and a half and then it's going to be great. Yeah. Okay. You're almost there. All right. Yeah. And, and when someone says to me, like um, one of my students the other day said, oh, it wasn't great today, Toby, but I know that's, um, he said, I know that's okay because I'm just trying this. I said, no, that's not okay. <laughs> it no. shouldn't, it, it, I was like, no, don't, don't, don't settle for that. You need to tell me it's not working. Yeah. Like, try something else. Yeah. Don't, don't tell me that it's because that, no. and, and, and I guess I'm going to say, Andres, there is a little small circumstance in regards to strike, but I'll say to a person that your best one should be really good. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like it was all rubbish. It's, there's a, no, no. there's a portion there, like four out of five were just really good. You're happy with. And I accept yeah. that there's going to be some poor ones. That's, that's very interesting. I'm, I'm glad you agree with that because yeah, I'm pretty big on that. <laughs> um, yeah. And there's one thing I actually learned from you, um, but you don't know, but I watched your thing there with Andrew Rice because my friend Kerrod, he spoke in that same coach camp thing with Andrew oh, Rice. Okay. And it really opened my eyes a lot where you spoke about, I think you used the term reverse engineering. And I, I, I use the term a lot where I will alter someone around P8, so that's or, or sorry, P9, like right arm level to the ground in the follow through for the people there to try and help alter someone's ball flight. So by adjusting a follow through position, and that's something that I'm going to say that I instinctively kind of did anyway. But then you kind of put it, you laid it down for me. Did you? Can you share a little bit on that? 
I learned it from Andy. Yeah. Okay. We had, um, we got back in the day, we would bring the players to, um, Port St. Lucie to the PGA training center every year over Christmas. And we just have like 12 days of just practicing and playing. And we'd have, we bring, um, yeah. it was interesting because we'd bring an adult group and we'd bring a junior group. That's and it would usually be so that the adults in the mornings, the players, the juniors would go play. And then in the afternoons, the adults would go play and we'd practice with the juniors. But we also will get in like some sort of expert. And for a couple of times, we brought in Andy Plummer to just help everybody out. And we as coaches would just kind of step back and watch. And the really f- interesting part was that all the adults were, you know, they slice. Yes. They're two dots down and across, blah, blah, blah. They do what 95% of all adult golfers do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the interesting part was that pretty much all of Andy's work would be putting the ball back on the arc, putting the handle forward, making the back swing, basically the arm swing low enough by them turning the pelvis and their chest enough, et cetera, et cetera, so they could swing more out and close in the face to path. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was always like the whole morning thing. And then basically move over to the juniors who were all swinging too far to the right, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, I know. Right? It's true. It's true. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. Um and he'd always like all the work would be on the on the front side of the circle. So it would always be follow through work, like where to end up, how the pelvis should be turned, how the, the amount of side bend, how much the chest should be turned, where the hand should exit, where the club should exit, how the yeah. hand should recock through the ball. And it would just be like I, I remember just watching it going, you know what? That's really, really interesting that when people swing too far to the right, it's a lot of times the low hanging fruit is actually post impact. Where do I need to finish up? Yeah. And when people are swinging too far to the left, a lot of times it is probably on the back swing or early down swing. So it's, yeah. Yeah. So it's, that's yeah. kind of how it was done. That's so interesting because that is so true. Like, I, th- I, you know, I'm going to say I have at times, you know, used follow through stuff for people, obviously we're trying to get them to swing more right about identifying, but, uh, hand position, but what Andres is saying there, like for something simple as, um, you know, talking about the person who swings too far to the right, say you're hooking it for the right handed golfer, you're going to see that when your right arm is level to the ground, you're going to see that your hands are quite a fair bit out in front of the kind of the right side of your body a little bit. So to the right of the flag, potentially, and you're going to see what I call this kind of smelling your armpits finish when your arms are up really high and you're smelling your armpits. And I use that a lot, smelling your armpits, stop smelling your armpits. And then, so if that person doing that, what Andreas has done and, you know, open my eyes a few years back, you can actually tell someone, work some, let's call it some half shots to make, keep it simple, but work to right arm level to the ground in a follow through position and try to get your hands more around, let's call it left rib cage kind of region and by doing that and putting your hands there the only way you can have done that is by moving your swing direction more to the left and you'll start to see a divot there and it's really cool and you get these great results with people and you kind of you got to explain to them as well when you're catching up with them like when you're talking to them and that if you can get your hands there your swing direction is going to move about four more degrees to the left and they're like what i'm like yeah just by this follow-through position so i'll like yeah after in a lesson, I might say to someone, hold your follow-through position and run in there and start organizing them. And they're like, yeah. why does this matter? I'm like, it does matter. Don't you reckon? Like it's, yeah. It's- and you, yeah, I agree. And it would be in, it, some at times, right? It, I think at, at, where I most often see it is that you work on this one thing and you get a boatload of other stuff that looks quirky starts falling into place. So all of a sudden from down the line, all the way from the top of the back swing to left arm parallel on the downswing to shaft parallel on the downswing, all these things start to line up. All of a sudden you see the pelvis turning a little bit faster, a little bit earlier, or you see the, the chest all of a sudden is turning more earlier just because they had a place they needed to go to. Yeah. And to get there, they had to do a bunch of stuff that is not necessarily great to think about. Yeah. It's probably not, it's hard, it's rare that it's like really good to think about where you need to be at at P6. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, or at seven a reference for that point. matter. A reference point. Yeah, it, exactly. But yeah. it's not like you're trying to get six right in your swing, like when yeah. the club is almost going the fastest. Like it's a really hard place to manipulate yeah. stuff. Yeah. And so what Andre is saying there, and I, I would, um, 
you know, what I like to say to people is I'm going to say a lot of my coaching is backswing related. So it's, it's yeah. getting the backswing organized so the downswing can be as reactionary as possible. And what Andres, what I'm also hearing him say there is that if we want to alter, say, from the top of the backswing down to impact, the best place to start is after impact. So I, I, I don't mind people staying conscious in their training through, you know, backswing positions through two, three, four, oh. right? But downswing, we want to, it's a, such a reactionary move. Um, we want to shift it. We shift it by post impact, and I, I think question. so. And, and most of the time, and you'll have I like that. you can have your pressure boards, and you can have different stuff. That when things move around and stuff, I'm perfectly fine with it. I'm just saying it's a hard. In my my experience, is that it's it's really really hard. It, it, it's nicer to make changes when the club's moving really slow. Yes. So either it's set up, or the top of the backswing, or on the follow through where the club's not doesn't have a lot of speed in it. Mm-hmm. And again, like I said, I would prefer that every single golf lesson I gave was set up and take away. Yes. Because those would be some of my easiest places to make changes because the club's not really moving all that fast. Mm-hmm. It's just my experience tells me that for sure setup's important. Yeah. Um, and what you build in before you hit super important. I just don't see that takeaway has a, as big of an effect as – when I speak to other coaches, how big of an effect they think it has. It's interesting. Yes. I, I, I might suck at it. I just don't see it. I'm not saying that I'm right. No, you're not the I'm first person to tell me that. I, I've, I don't, I've, I've look at, I look at Matthew Wolf and Nancy Lopez or Ray Floyd and I go, all right, it turns <laughs> out the spectrum's pretty freaking wide for where the club can be at B2. I, I, um, I, I would completely, um, yeah, I understand where you're coming from there. So what Andre is saying there, and I've heard it before, Shaheen's the same. Shaheen talks the same. He just doesn't worry about takeaway, right, um, as much. He doesn't doesn't mind him too much at all what, what a player does. Yeah. Well, look at um, Matthew Fitzpatrick, right? Yeah. Yeah, he's he's way in, right? Hands, hands I don't know if hands are out, but club's in. Club's in a lot. But It's way in. Yeah, 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 it's way in. But to... To also, um, to kind of, you know, to continue that conversation around that takeaway, if you see someone at left arm level to the ground in the backswing and say the shaft is just way too laid down and the trail arm is too far under, like that, you know, yeah. probably supinated there, yeah. then potentially you, you, could, you could alter that by getting the trail arm more on top of it too, right? Yeah, you know what I mean. So, yeah. like, but then, yeah, but then, yeah, I agree. And if yeah, you yeah. can make the case that three is the problem and why the ball's doing what it does, yes, good by me. Yeah, but it's not that. Oh, it's pointing outside the ball line, so we just have to change it because you can't <laughs> play golf from there. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, I agree. I'm serious. That's what I hear. I've got a DVD of one of the most famous golfers and the co- coaches in the world back in the day saying like, you can't play golf from there. Yeah, I think I know who it is. <laughs> yeah. Initials DL, maybe, is it? No. No, it's not. I think it's, I think it's JM. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, it's just like just yeah, death move. Right. Just that death move, and you got this big like, cross and like a, a death skull move. going like death he, move. He, like, does right, use that. he does <laughs> use that term. <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic. That's been, that's that's really cool. Oh, I'm glad. You know, one thing I like, um, and I spoke to Hugh about this, Andreas, and um, I forgot the term that he used, but I'm, I'm going to use self-doubt, but he had another term for it, which was- Imposter um, syndrome. Yes, imposter syndrome. That's exactly right. But but I, at the same time, Andreas, I'm, I'm going to say that I- the reason why I study a lot or try to learn a lot as much as I can is to make sure I've always got the answers, right? Like or to the best of my ability, I just don't like when I hear people out there coaching who've just done the traineeship and are just coaching, right? It just blows my mind. So when I, you know, tomorrow I'm going to go see, talk to, you know, some of the world's best golf coach I'm lucky enough to talk to tomorrow, right? Because the Aussie opens on, I'm going to go up and hang out with them. And I have that. But when I have conversations with like, you know, who I classify as great golf coach like you, and then we share these same ideas, 
it makes me go, oh, that's right. I'm actually doing okay. You know what I mean? Like I'm doing the right yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? And I, I think your students will, their performance will let you know if you're on the right track. Yes. Um, yeah. I think I've been there. I remember three years in, I was like, this is easy. It's <laughs> like I'm already, I know more than most and I know what I'm doing. Why come, how come they don't just do that? And all this yeah. stuff. And I still remember the day where I just was like, shit. I was so dumb that I thought I knew what was going on. Yeah. And I didn't know at all what was going on. And I think once you get past that point, I don't think your level of confidence is ever going to get as high again as it was back then. I agree. But, I agree. And, but <laughs> I mean, because what we're, I mean, honestly, we can't just like be too full of ourselves because what we're really doing is we're guessing. It's all yeah. we're doing. Yeah. We're guessing. Now, as we improve our knowledge, our guesses become better and better. But we don't know. It's a live human being in front of us. It, we don't know. Yeah. And people that are trying to convince people that that can't work. I mean, that's like, dude, you don't know. Yes. yes. And if you're trying to now, if, again, you can predict that it's just like betting, right? Like you, the more you bet, the better you get at predicting yeah. the future. Or I guess stock market. I don't have stocks, but if you like stuff like that, you become better. Yeah. You I, become better as a coach, but you don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's another art of coaching is, um, I was talking to one of you know coach the other day and he was telling me what, what he was trying to do with his student. And it was a list of like 10 things long. And I remember saying to him, if that student was a robot, yeah, that'll work. You know, you can just plug this in, plug that in, plug this in, plug that in. But unfortunately we're not dealing with robots. And, and I think that's when we're talking earlier about you can have the knowledge, but it's when to do it. Right, what you were saying before, and when to pull, yeah, when to you pull the right string. You got to have a plan, right? Like you got to go. Okay, I would like to change all these ten things, but yeah. where the hell do I start? Because I know I'm only going to, at most, I'm going to input maybe one thing statically and one thing dynamically, and that's all I get. Yeah, I get like a setup thing, or a ball position, or a grip change, or maybe multiple things at setup because they have time to think, and then I get one thing during the swing. That's yeah. that's what I get at most. Yeah. So what's most important and what do I, well, that's the one that improves the ball flight the most. Okay, yeah. good. Let's take that one and let's see if we can go down that road. Maybe he does it so much that the ball starts curving the other direction and then I can get into that piece that actually neutralizes that. And then I can balance these things out. Because I think, again, that's the important part is knowing the different components of what moves what, what it does Three-dimensionally, it never really is just like, okay, I'm just going to fix the path and everything else stays the same. But knowing that, knowing what's the limit, like you can't just per – person is, I don't know, they're coming over the top, their right shoulder is staying too high on the downswing. Yeah. You, you, well, for how long do you want them to side bend to the right and keep their back to the target? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. great advice, and it might be really good for a long time, but at some point, they're likely going to swing too far to the right. Yeah. Now, yeah. Is it, are they overdoing this piece, or is there another piece they're missing now? Yeah, yeah. And you can get to your 10 points. You just can't do it all at the same yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. And, um, well, let's – well, we're going to go through your system. We're going to leave it alone, right, your preferences, because we're going to, we're going to go on too long. But I might wait for another time. I, I, I really want to help people like obviously this is what this podcast is about, right? It's helping people and we get lots of comments from coaches, right? Lots of coaches that listen and lots, cool. of, students, lots of students. And one of the things I, I want to share with them is that case study. You used a case study in your Andrew Rice thing that you did, the um, coach camp, whatever it's called, where I mentioned then about you had this really good player I'm, I should have watched it. I was going to watch it. I told my other friend today to watch it. <laughs> you're one because I told him that you're coming to the pod. I said, Will, you should watch this. He called me on the way home from the Aussie yeah. Open and, uh, you know, one of the players that we're talking about, anyway, one of the players. But I said, you should go watch Andreas' thing. I'm, I've got him on the podcast tonight. It's fantastic, this thing. I've, I said, I've emailed you before. You need to watch it. Anyways, there was a case study when you were working with a a really good golfer um, 
and you had to go about it a different way. You, you couldn't go about it in a certain manner. You had to go backwards, I think is the term you might have used uh, coming back. Do you remember which case study I'm talking about here? Uh, he was a yeah. good, good player. I think he might have been in the national yeah. team and he came to you and he had a, a problem with his golf swing he didn't like and yeah. you were really concerned about making changes but still keeping him at a high level. Can yes. you Can you – is there a possible chance that you can kind of share that story? So I think it could be of good value. Yeah. So it was likely Victor, right? So he would, he would basically have this really level hip turn – where what it really was was that his pelvis was staying flexed forward on the backswing and on the downswing. So really, if he was just doing that and just kind of turning really level in his pelvis, he'd probably get a path that's pretty good, Yeah, actually, on both sides of the ball. So now the problem then becomes, all right, we've got to get him to a spot where he is – he was he was a – he – preferred to draw the ball when his pelvis was too level on the downswing and he stayed too flexed forward, all of a sudden he'd hit this thing that was like a leaky cut. Yeah. So it makes sense for us to start working on the follow through first. And it made sense for us to move his pelvis a little bit more forward at practice and then learning how to basically extend his legs and his pelvis up at the ground, to take the club out of the ground, which also yeah. helped him raise the handle, which helped him, shallow out the angle of attack a little bit, but also helped him swing a little bit further to the right with a close face. Now, he really, really likes that feel. He felt it was powerful, which it is powerful, yeah. to be able to lift the handle up through the golf ball instead of it just kind of staying low. Um, How was that before you move to the next stage there? Yeah. Getting him to move his pelvis that way and, you know, working yeah. on, let's call it, let's working on his extension. Yeah. Did that... I'm going to say that's one of the pieces that when I've been coaching in my experience that that's not a thing that just happens. Like it, it, no. doesn't, it doesn't click. How much training went into him having to do that extension piece to the point where you guys were satisfied with him performing? Well, I'd, say, I'd say some, but I don't, I don't think it was that hard because I think when the player gets the sense of it, yeah. I also think that it'd be, it's a really powerful feel. Yeah. Like they can feel it. Like they can feel the contact. It's less – um, like clicky and then all of a sudden they feel compression of the golf ball. Yeah, okay. Because I think what they're really feeling is the spin loft lowering. Yeah. Um, angle of attack's moving up but the loft from the club's moving down and all of a sudden they can feel this thing smashing mm. and they'll feel the sense that when they, the faster they extend and lift their pelvis, the more it speeds up. So yeah. it becomes a thing that they would like to do more of. Yeah, um, okay. And the way we do it, I we I always do. I call it the world's longest chip. Is yeah. basically like just put the weight forward and just make a backswing where we don't get past shaft parallel on the backswing, and you have to hit the ball as far as you can. Yeah, yeah. there's pretty much no other way. Yeah, to actually like, like to add speed to that club head than doing it that way. You can't do it with your arms and hands for sure. Yeah, and you can't do it by turning. So, so what Andreas is – sorry, Andreas, is well, there's like yeah. the club starting at um, uh, level to the ground in the downswing, so yeah. call it P6, right? Yeah. And then from there, I like to use the terminology like it's like you're if you're in the gym and you're pulling the rope, like you're pulling it up with yeah. your left arm. And then yeah. to get that ball to move up, it's nearly like a kettlebell swing as well. Like you've got to yeah. drive the pelvis yeah. up that way there. Yeah, okay, kick on. Yeah. You're using all the muscles that you'd use in the deadlift basically. Yep. Yep. Um but I also know that, that he's going to like this, and he liked it. Well, I found out he liked it. So I also know he's going to do this a lot. And all of a sudden, at some point, he's going to start swinging too far to the right. Yeah. Now, does that necessarily mean that he did it too much? It might not. It probably just means that we're still doing this flat flexed pelvis on the backswing where he's moving everything too far in, and now he's mm -hmm. extending up out of it. So now we almost have to start – tilting the pelvis better on the backswing so it becomes more of the right hip going up than it becomes the right hip going around. Yeah. Which, on the other hand, helps us swing straighter into the golf ball. Because club so you could almost think of it as like if you had a plane board of sorts. Um, yeah. I got, I guess this is my laundry detergent right behind here. <laughs> if you said, this is from down the line, this, this is the plane board, right? Yeah. The yeah. player's hitting that way. What you're basically doing is that you're trying to take this entire plane 
and you're just kind of gradually making this more and more vertical. Yep. Yep. By on the front side extending more, and on the back side tilting the pelvis more to the left or getting the right hip more up. Yep. To steepen everything more up. Instead of if I just extend more in the follow through, I'm basically just moving the plane that way. Yes. Yes. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, I completely agree. I completely. Yeah, I understand. So, so by what what what's happening is that when you flex. Um, what Andre is saying is that things tend to go more round and we have less yes. vertical. So he needs to put another vertical piece back in through yeah. the more through the pelvis. Less Matt Kuchar, more Colin Montgomery. <laughs> That's fucking perfect. So so can you can can you can you tell me what was the benefit in going that way and not the other way? Going backswing first and follow through? Uh, because he was already kind of hitting these weak cuts. So I didn't oh, need yeah. more left path, which basically the tilting of the pelvis, which would raise up his right side of his chest, which would la- raise up his arms, was actually just going to be giving him more cut. Yeah, because he was already so He didn't want this deflection on it that he was feeling, right? He actually mm-hmm. wanted more compression. Yeah. Um, so that's the reason why we did it. Yeah, because he was already kind of working would, against his pelvis in the backswing to get the arms up anyway. Yeah. And then as soon as yeah. you get the pelvis tilted, the arms are going to be way yeah. up. Yeah, 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 I get it. So, yeah. it, so it was, it's where I would say normally, again, this is not like a guarantee, but actually most of the time I usually work steeper before I go shallower. So I usually always move the swing direction more left, low point more forward, angle of attack more down first, and then I'll shallow it out later. Okay. In his case, that was the opposite. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's and, and, rare that somebody's hitting it like borderline good, but like low point a little too close to the ball, and you have them swing further to the right that they start hitting it better. Yeah. And 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 this or is coming. This is coming from a highly skilled player too, making a big shift, right? Like he's a good yeah, player, right? Just, yeah, just in general, it's always good. You can you know shit. the divot's a little deep, the ball flight's a little low. Fine. Now we're low points forward enough. Now we can move it back by doing whatever we need to be doing, whether it's in the shaft or the shoulder or the yeah. pelvis or the chest or the side bend or you name it. Uh, okay. That, that's that's good. I like it. I like it a lot. I like that. I think that's I think that's a really good one, right? So, Hugh Mar told me, why do all your players have the same looking golf swing? Fuck yeah. <laughs> 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 they don't. They don't. <laughs> no, no, they don't. Because people well, don't pay attention. That's what so I will funny. Say, it's so funny. I'll put it this way. I'll, yeah, 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 I'll put it this way. It depends on what you look at. I will say this, that they do, because I have a model and because I have a system in place and I have a way of problem solving my stuff, they will, if they work with me long enough, 10, 12 years, they do start looking kind of the same. Yeah. I I can probably understand. Because you're you're getting him from a long age too. We're not, you're not dealing with like. You're dealing with these kids who you're nurturing through a lot yeah. of the time as well, right? Yeah. So you can mold but them. But I would also say that if you go into our facility when we are doing technique stuff, it'll be rare that you'll see two out of 18 players practicing the same. Yes. Because they are they have different ball flights with different issues and they need different things. Um, I would also say that if you actually start to look and look a little bit deeper, what you'll see is that their ball position, their grips, their shaft placement is set up, their, um, the amount they turn, uh, the what's called the angle of their lead arm at the top of their backswing, their exits are not the same. Yes. Now, the same principles were used, mm-hmm. but they're not necessarily the same. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think I've got nothing but TrackMan data and Rob Neal's 3D system telling yeah. me they don't do the same. Yeah, I know. I, know. I, I understand <laughs> so, where you're coming from. Oh, but mate, it's a, I told there, there will be it. some that are similar, like yeah. the 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 sequence, the rhythm, all these different things will look similar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But and, even and, the tempo is not the same. I, I'm also going to say as well is that 
I'm as much of a victim of my environment as the next person on drains as well. And I, I don't, I'm not saying yeah. victim in a bad way, but I'm very yeah. much environment dependent. So I'm surrounded by someone I'll start. Like my wife used to always joke. She knew when I traveled to golf tournaments with my English friends who were like English golf pros because yeah. I come back to talking like I'm from the UK. <laughs> like, so, yeah. like so the same thing happens when you're in your environment. And I understand because I talked to Jay about it too, about the same thing. Because they're not the same. They're not the same Jay Kelly because he's, you know, yeah. Jay's going to hang out with you, right? Um, yeah. And I talk to Jay regularly. Great guy. Um, one, one thing I want to ask you in regards to all of that, because I, I believe that grip plays a, you know, a major influence in, in the way that we move, right, within the golf swing, right? Um, and when I see a lot of your players are in, you know, we're going to use the term similar, not the same like you, right? Similar preferences and things like this. Yeah. Can you tell me, um, I've always thought that they must have a similar preference grip as well, or I could be wrong or, or not at all. All the, grip, all the grips are different. I say I don't. It's rare that you'll see anybody I coach who has a strong left and a weak right. Oh, yeah. Like a butterfly grip. Yeah. I think that's extremely rare. You will see the opposite. I have plenty of guys who has this – like weak left, strong right. Yeah. One of them just finished third at Q school. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that there's a, it depends on different things. I would say as a regular, I mean, I would just say 20 degrees turn with the left hand, 20 degrees turn to the right with the right hand. That would be my preference. Yeah. That's about as freaking neutral as I can make it. Yeah. Yeah. I get you. I get you. That's, but that's not – so if somebody is like asking, how do I hold a club? That would probably be what I'd suggest it to Yeah, them. yeah, yeah. Most of the players that come to me, they already have found our way of holding a club. Yes, yeah. Um, so again, I think it becomes dependent on a lot of things. Now, the reason why I would – my starting point is 20 and 20 is probably just because it's neutral. But if I was going to do something, I'd probably – I'd rather the left hand be 10 and the trail hand or the right hand be 30 than the other way around. Interesting. Would, I, I'm going to say that might be a little bit away from what you might hear out there. Why, why is that? Really? Why, well, you're talking about the top hand being a little weaker than stronger. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you just end up it's, – it's instead of ending up in the spot where things are going like this or something like that, where both things, both, both lifts are extended mm. on the downswing, I'd much rather it being like there's there's joints in the way, right? So if I have zero turn left-hand grip, let's just say I have that. Yeah. Let's say I'm John Rahm, Colin Morikawa, Jordan Spieth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jose Maria Olafa Ball, Hogan. I think Bryson, Bryson pretty weak in the left hand. Bryson's a really yeah. good example as well. There's uh, there's some range of motion and stuff that's in place all of a sudden where the radial deviation I can make to my 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 lead wrist mm. can only get to this, and then I'll have to extend the wrist to get more, yeah. which completely opens up the club face. Yeah, where the, okay. And sometimes that just gets a little – I don't – again, if you're going to hit it the furthest – perfectly fine um but if yeah. i want to speed up the body and have it do different things i'd much rather this being a little bit in this direction this being a little bit more in this direction just so the club doesn't almost bounce on the shoulder yeah versus this where it goes like super oh it's yeah so what andreas is saying there right is about the left hand being i'm going to use the term as marginally weaker right people out there listening maybe yeah one and a half two knuckles i'm not going to say it's weaker yeah. right but away from like the three knuckles they're looking down at is that when you get to the top of the backswing one of the features you'll see of andreas's players is that he has this nice l shape let's call it between the lead arm and the club shaft which is around about 90 degrees and you're saying that you can control and when we're using the term radial deviation net, that's the thumbs kind of moving up to you like you're using a hammer yeah. is that he can control the radial better from there and it won't overload as much well it's not it's that's not it it's just the more i put my left hand on top of the club it's yeah. not about radial anymore it's actually extension extension yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, that's just wrist extension that'll end up looking like wrist cock or whatever we call it right that creates that angle yeah yeah 
So, I mean, my, um, we have uh, one of my really good friends and colleagues who's the men's pro team coach for the Golf Federation. His name is Thomas Larson. He's yeah. like a big grip pervert, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I have players that I've got three, four guys now who are in the pro team who I've worked with for forever. Thomas goes to camps with him. He'll be at tour events and stuff, and he likes them. He's been their men's national team coach. And he calls it the uh, the weak left, strong right, He which I would just say is like kind of like a Colin Morikawa grip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He calls, he, he calls it the hot dog grip. <laughs> oh, you yeah. just kind of see like this long left thumb show up, and it just <laughs> looks like, like, a, like yeah, a, yeah, a hot dog, yeah, right? Yeah. And he always like every now and then he'll come over to me at an event or something. He goes like, the hell's with that hot dog grip? I go, I don't know. I just kind of, it's good by me. Like, I don't, I don't mind it. And they hit it well and they control the face well. I'm yeah. not saying that's what I coach everybody. I just yeah. happen to have two guys who are extremely good ball strikers. Uh, Sebastian Friedrichsen, who, yeah. wonder how he's getting along. He was doing really well uh, when we got on the call in his debut. Um, and a guy named Victor Svensson who both grip it that way. Okay. And yeah. I just never bothered to change it because they, been really really good at hitting the ball ever since i met them. yeah yeah oh yeah no i i've always um i'm gonna say I have a fascination about grips but i really enjoy learning about the grip and people's preferences and um also what happens to certain grips you know and what what types of things we like to see and what people like to see because um i think a lot of people have their own little tendencies as well what what they like to see with the grip just as much as anything else you know what i mean yeah. like what they yeah, see yeah. um because a lot of the time we spend a lot of time talking to people how they're holding the club not so much with an elite golfer like i i got a guy who's golf pro and dead set he is so strong in both hands like you you can't even see like his right hand is so under and his left yeah. hand is so on top and yeah, I swear I get stronger every time I see him. <laughs> it's just like, I does, just he, does he play? Does he play well? He's playing great. Plays very great. Yeah. yeah so yeah. you know what? Yeah. Well, no, no, I'm, and again, I'm not saying that if it's like Zach Johnson won the freaking Masters in the Open. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, no, I'm not, right? not going to change it. Boo, no. Boo Weekly is one of the best ball strikers ever on the PGA Tour. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look at Brendan Steele. He's the same too, right? He's like yeah, it's yeah, it's an acquired taste. Yeah. Now I'm saying what I'm saying is that if Brendan Steele came to me for a golf lesson now, I'd never touch his grip. Oh yeah, yeah. What I'm also saying is that if Brendan Steele came to me as an 11, 12 year old, and we had six months indoors every winter, there'd be at some point I would touch that grip. Yeah, I just I would. I just know I, I might be wrong, but I just know deep within myself, yeah. I'd be looking at that going like the amount of different stuff this player needs to do. Yep. And again, I might be wrong, but I would have, sometimes I would predict that the body has to move a certain way where I'm going like, Oh, that's probably not yeah. like going to be great long term with the side bend the player needs to do and different things. And again, I might be wrong because I'm trying to predict the future, Yeah. but you would never see anybody at coming out of our place who would have two hands that were turned 90 degrees on the club if they came at a young age. Yes. Yes. And there's also an argument. I, I, I can, I can agree with you. So what, what people are probably listening is like, what do you mean? Brennan Steele was one on the PGA tour. Rah, rah, rah. Yeah. You know, why would you touch it? But also there's also an argument of, I wonder how good he could have been with. Well, and we, again, right? yeah, it's, it's, we don't, and we don't know, right? Yeah, we, guess. we don't know. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm just, and again, like it's, it used to be my test every time would be, I ask coaches like Jordan Spieth shows up age 12. He's the best player in the state of Texas already at the age mm. 12 with that grip. Are you touching it? No. And of course it's easy for a lot of people to say no. Yeah. I just know deep down that it's not even the weakness of the left hand. It was just where it was placed in the hand that I would, I just I would, I, I would, I would have touched it. I, I just know I would. And well, again, I might be wrong. I don't, I just know within myself, I would have moved that club around. Yes. And actually, you know what, Andreas, because we're, we're talking about Jordan Spates golf grip here, right? And the, the main reason I started looking at Jordan Spates golf grip about, a couple of years ago when he started struggling, right? Like he was the man when he came out yeah. was you could just see through the transition that 
oh, I'm talking about a, a world beater here, but it was like he didn't have control of that shaft in the transition of the golf swing. It was like he was losing it at the top. I don't know. Yeah. I'm, I'm probably going to get. But he was still holding it like that when he was winning majors, right? Yes. Yes, that's true. So, but so I'm, I'm again. I'm saying Jordan Speed shows up now yeah. on the PGA Tour. I'm never touching his grip ever. Yeah. yeah. Ever. Yeah. I'm saying if he shows up at age 12, mm. and we've got six month a winner in into a net, I'm pretty yeah. sure we can solve it. Yeah, and you know what though? This is where you'd be arguing with Hugh because Hugh would be saying no, right? He might. Maybe. Nah, maybe. I think. I think I, he wouldn't. Touch, I, I, I don't touch grips with good players. Like yes. I just with tour players. I don't yes. freaking touch. Like that's yeah, the yeah, entire yeah, sensory yeah. system of where the face is. Yeah, yeah. I don't touch it. Yeah. But I'm saying with a player in general that shows up at age 12 who's got this like really hard side bend and this has yeah. to like basically stand the shaft up through impact and all these different things to make this face not point left to get the ball in the air. I'm going to go, you know what, dude? I think there's a better way of doing this. Mm. Mm. Yeah. No, I agree. Hey, hey Andres, I've got to let you go. It's, I could talk all day. And um, I could too. Mate, I love, I love, it. it's getting late here and I'm actually uh, <laughs> getting picked up in the morning to go to the Aussie Open to watch um, – when the guys tee off, like second group, I haven't even seen how he's finished. We, nice. he's the, we're still playing when on the call. Yeah, one of our former players is playing in that thing. Uh, who, who? How's he going? Do you know? Yeah, he's doing awful. Yeah, I think he shot plus five. John Axelson. It's he hasn't been in the academy for forever, but he was okay. one of the, like the founding, the founding members. Oh wow! Ah, oh, cool. Yeah. Well, yeah. One, of, one few- of the best drivers of the ball I've ever seen. Oh, really? He must, he, he, must, he must have played the Aussie too because the Aussie was playing harder. I hope so. Cause the he did. Yeah, he yeah, missed yeah. it by one, I think. He missed m- miss what? He missed the cut. I think he missed the cut by one. But on he's as, just, I mean. Oh, no, still one more day to go. Yeah, you got it. You know, last week he missed it by one. Oh, um, the PGA. At the PGA, sorry. Yeah, yeah. but he's, uh, you got to find him tomorrow if you see him on the range. Yes. I think there's a chance that's going to be, even though it's a good field, it's going to be one of the three best golf swings you'll see on the range, technically. That does really? not mean that he is going to win the golf tournament or anything, but... Well, we've seen that. You said that about Marcus, right? I think I think he might be my... And I don't coach John. I just... I know him, right? He practices in our facility every now and then. He's a good guy. Yeah, yeah. He might have my favorite golf swing in the world. Oh, wow. I'll have to take a, take a peek. It's I'm, pretty freaking good. Yeah, I'm in there for the whole day, so I'll take a peek for sure. It's amazing how quickly yeah. golf... Like, traveling to tournaments, though, and just... Time gets away from you so quickly. People think you've got all day, but you don't. <laughs> you know, like, no. you, but you, no. you're barely lucky enough to fit in a sausage roll. It's it's yeah. it's, it's crazy. But um, mate, where can people get you, Andreas? So you obviously, I'll put you. I'll put all your Instagram handles below and your skills profile. Are you still yeah. doing? Are you still doing online lessons and, and packages and stuff like that? Can people still get you? Yeah, yeah, still do, still do all that on Skillist. Um, I think. I think my email is connected to my Instagram account, but I don't. I, I'm not good at responding to emails. So if people have anything, just reach out on um, Instagram via DMs. Um, yeah. There's also if people are interested in the systematic coaching stuff that I do with you. Um, there's yeah. actually yeah. on Hugh Ma's website. We're fortunate enough to have some of it recorded. Yes. Um, some mm-hmm. of our seminars, which are available to people if they want to see them, if they're interested in it. We also, I think we're setting up a couple of seminars for next year also. But if yeah. people have questions, just feel free to feel free to reach out. I think they're really good. I just don't think they are as, as sexy as what most people look at, search, search out. I think yeah. they're looking for the next newest whatever technique. And I think what we're doing is actually helping coaches have their stuff organized and knowing that yeah. there's not a right and a, there's not a certain way of doing it. It has to be this way or else it's wrong. There's yeah. multiple ways of doing it and there's multiple ways of succeeding as long as you have your priority straight. And I think you'll see both sides of the coin if you attend our stuff. Yeah. And I, I completely agree with that And for, for coaches listening to this, right? I, I would encourage you to do it. Because let's look at it from the fact of like, it's kind of like you're helping coaches piece their knowledge together to to organize it better, to organize what th- yeah. their knowledge better, where people could be going and upskilling themselves at these um, 
you know, where we can upskill ourselves like Scott Cox, or we can upskill ourselves with, you know, Stack and Tilt or, or Morad, whatever you want to do. But this is helping you put all those skills you've got and organize it and how to coach, which I think is, um, yeah, big gap. Yeah, and you're market. getting it from two guys who I think our resume says that our students are improving and they're getting better. <laughs> I would agree. Um, who are doing it completely differently which actually shouldn't be a problem. It should actually give coaches some sort of relief mm. that, you know what, there's more than one way to fix these different things and you can have your preferences and you can have your different things as long as your students are improving. Yeah. Yes. That's exactly right. It's exactly right. It's just our, yes, that's the point. We need our students to get yes. better. <laughs> we need our students to yeah. get better. So that's the whole point. So the whole thing started. It's helping more coaches so they can help more players. My book is full, so I can't help more players Yeah. besides online, which is still like a tiny bit. Yeah, and, and I like that with what you're um, doing as well because you've got that systematic because you could easily be helping coaches out with your preferences too, right? Which is of, you've, you've, you've built them along the lines of – stack and tilt like i guess you're saying sure. what you're saying, but that's something that you know you should look into as well but what you're doing is if not better but i think what you're doing what you're highly, doing is highly recommend it yeah hey this has been great thanks for coming on the golf coach podcast man i really appreciate it i'll get this published uh thanks Toby. everywhere we'll put all the links below and uh that was fun thanks man. a blast yeah. bye